Do you have solo economic dependency? That is, if you aren't working, you aren't making money. The Art of Passive Income Podcast is the solution. Discover passive income models so you can enjoy life on your own terms. Let freedom ring. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. I'm putting on my anchor man voice today because our guest is a big deal. But before I talk to my guest, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host. You know him. You love him. The brain, the professor, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. You're not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Learn anything about anything, investorninjas.com. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm psyched for this interview. I really am. Let's just, let's just skip the pleasantries and get right into it because this guy is a wealth of knowledge. David Osborne is our guest. If you don't know David, he is the owner of the fourth largest residential real estate company in the country. He is the founder of Go Abundance and a New York Times best-selling author. David Osborne, how are you? I'm awesome, Mark. What a great intro. I appreciate it being short. That's amazing. Thanks. Hey, Scott. How's it going? Good. Outstanding. So, David, as is customary in these interviews, we're going to rewind the tape and take us through the very beginning of how you became this rock star entrepreneur. It's uh, more of a success by default than anything else. Uh, you're, you're, the one drive I've always had is freedom. I wanted to be financially free. I didn't want to have to answer to anybody. Um, there's probably a lot that created that drive in me, but when I got out of college, I worked door-to-door -door computer sales for a while. Um, didn't like it. After a year, I sold all my possessions, hitchhiked around the world for two years. I came back dead broke, was minus $1,300 in debt. And my mom, who had gotten into real estate after my dad retired from the army, said, why don't you come work for me? And I said, mom, I want a real job. I don't want to go into real estate. I want a real job. So I'll come work for you temporarily to pay off my credit card. And that's it. Don't expect me to be here forever. And here I am 27 years later. I paid off my credit cards. You'll be happy to know. And I'm still in real estate. So why, why go abundance? Why tribe of millionaires? Kind of tell us where the, or, you know, the origin of that came. Sure. So look on the journey of financial freedom and business ownership, both of which I've done, you, 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 you get some scars along the way. You pay a price. If you really want to be successful, usually you're born with certain things that work and some things that don't work. And the way you get into harmony with what works is by shedding the part that doesn't work. Unfortunately, we're usually somewhat attached to the part that doesn't work. We use it as part of our identity. Like, Oh, I'm sweet. I'm kind. I don't treat people badly or I don't know, whatever it is. Right. And, um, and so in my journey, I had to shed a lot. One of the seminar to shed, the easiest way to shed is to learn from others. And I used to do a bunch of seminars, listen to a bunch of tapes today. They're called podcasts and uh, just pick up knowledge from others. That's the easiest way to learn. The most uh, effective but least recommended way is just pain and mistakes. So in my journey, I've had plenty of both. One of the seminars I went to, uh, they taught us to pick out a guy from the group and they said, this guy's gonna hold you accountable for the rest of your life and you're gonna hold them accountable. The pay is gonna be the, the, the mutual accountability. I got into a peer partnership with a guy called Pat Hyben and uh, he held me Pat. accountable. Yeah, Pat's a great guy. He held me accountable to being productive, staying on focus, getting done what I said I was going to do. I held him accountable to the same. Seven years into our accountability journey, we met a guy called Tim Rode. He started us holding us accountable to having a fulfilled life, keeping ourselves in great shape. We all three held each other accountable to financial freedom. And we've created this kind of energy around accountability, uh, transparency, and authenticity. Today, all three of us are financially free. We're all married. We all have kids. We all contribute to very good causes and we all have mailbox money. Every one of us has, you know, Tim has 18 checks a month. Pat has 42 checks a month. I have something close to 100 plus checks a month coming in, whether I go to work or not. And this accountability and transparency is what enabled us and goal setting is what enabled us to get to where we are. After doing this for a number of years, we just decided we were sick of each other's stories and said, why don't we invite some other people and see if they're interested in what we've literally been doing for now 14 years or so. And Go Bundance was born and we went from seven people to uh, 23 people to 46 to 100. Now we've got 250 members in like eight years. 
of people that are craving authenticity, transparency, and accountability, and financial freedom. So it's been a journey that's been interesting and, and a lot of fun. I love it. Scott Todd. I think that um, it, it's interesting to hear the the story about the, the personal accountability, right? You know, like you get somebody that's going to hold you accountable and, you know, it, it, it holds you, it holds you to the fire. And then the other piece I thought was interesting is, is you go down this path, you think, oh, this is a short-term thing, like real estate is going to be a short-term thing. But then the longer you stick to it, even though it gets boring at times and, you know, like it just, it, you, you know it. The, the longer you stick to it, I think that that's where you find your groove and that's where you get your success. I guess it goes back to the 10,000 hours, right? Absolutely, man. I mean, you're, you know, it, you just got to stick with something and you'll get to be an expert at it and you got to stick with it and stick with it. And it doesn't matter whether it's Amazon businesses or real estate or programming, but you're absolutely right. Like I'm, I do more deals and make more money in a year now than I did in my entire decade of the twenties or probably even my thirties. I bet I'm doing more deals, making more money because I did so much in my twenties and thirties and made so many mistakes. And I've just got the, the time on task and the tread on the tires. You don't get expert at anything unless you just stick to it. And I, I, you've said 10,000 hours. I always say 10 years. Like you, you, it takes you five years just to become an amateur and then another five to become reasonably proficient. And it's a lifetime of journey. And the thing about it is you pick up the first 75% pretty quickly, but all the money is made in the last 25% of wisdom and knowledge, right? So you just got to keep with it, keep plugging away. And to this day, I'm still a learning junkie. I still read 40 books a year. I listen to 40 podcasts a year. I'm a guest on usually 20 podcasts. So I'm just constantly trying to sharpen the saw. Uh, I go to like 10 conferences, probably a year, maybe a little less, maybe eight, um, because I'm still after that last five or 10% of knowledge that makes all the difference. You know, Scott, you know what's so funny about that is I, I feel like David has the algorithm for life and financial success. So if it's constant learning growth, it's accountability, it's grit. It doesn't get more simple in that sense, yet it's so difficult for people to execute. And my question, David, is if we all know how to, let's just take health, right? We all know what we need to do to be healthy. It's, right. it's, it's pretty simple. Why do so many people get stuck in your opinion? Well, we all get stuck and procrastinate, especially when we're young. We get confused. We try to chase too many rabbits. There's an old saying, the man who chases two rabbits catches none or goes hungry or something. Um, but I think also mainly you don't hang out with the right people. Like if you hang out with the right people, they form and channel you into success. And if you don't and you just keep a mediocre bunch of friends, you, you know, you change from the outside in, not the inside out, my belief is. Your, your choice is the internal piece. Once you make the choice, everything you put around you is going to affect you way more than what you do internally. If you're born in uh, Sri Lanka, it doesn't matter how motivated you are. You're probably not going to become a multimillionaire real estate guy. Now there are some, and obviously it's possible, but if you're born in the United States of America, it's way easier to hit that number and be financially free. So your environment really matters. But even if you're in America, if you're hanging out with a bunch of people that just want to watch football all weekend and argue about maybe politics and drink beer and chase women, whatever it may be, um, or men, depending on what sex you are, uh, you're, you're likely not to move your life forward, you know? And it took me a while to learn this too. I, I used to like to party. I used to like to, you know, be cool and be seen as cool. Um, but, you know, even though I was a dork, I still had this thought that maybe someday somebody would think I was cool. But then you realize all that stuff is just wasted time. Now, how do you change that? You hang out with people that are more productive, more focused. All of a sudden you notice they go to bed early and they get up early and they attack life and they have an agenda and the real, so that's the one thing who you hang out with. And then, and then the real magic of everything is accountability and accountability is only effective if you're transparent. So if you don't want to be held accountable as a kid, I hated the word accountability. My dad was a green beret colonel for crying out loud. It was like a miserable concept to me of being accountable. But today it's my favorite word. Accountability is like the breakfast of champions because my accountability makes me a better dad. It makes me work out more. It makes me hang out with my wife more. The one thing you didn't mention in your intro, which I agree with everything you said is balance. Like, and that comes later. Sometimes I was definitely unbalanced for 10 or plus years, but today it's balance. What's the point of chasing more money? I have enough money to live and to do anything I need in life. And I still like the game, but if I'm spending 60 hours a week working when I have a three-year-old and a 10 year old, instead of investing in them and going to their sports games and trying to help them grow as humans, um, 
you know, what's the point? Like then you've missed the whole point of the exercise, which isn't more, it's freedom. And then what can you do with what you've created? So balance, I think is also a key component, but I don't recommend it early. I think you should be as unbalanced as hell early because I certainly was. That's really interesting concept. Scott Todd, what are your thoughts about culture, environment, accountability, and then when you're young, kind of saying yes to everything and chasing and, and, and hustling. And then as you start getting more and more success, sort of pruning all that and saying no to a lot of things and focus. I mean, you know, Mark, it, it, it brings up a valid point, right? Because ultimately, if, if when you're younger, if you just start to cherry pick, you know, like we hear people say all the time, like, oh, say no and get more stuff done, right? You know, well, how do you know what you don't know if you're saying no, right? Like you start saying yes, like Jim Carrey has a movie, The Yes Man. He goes on this wild adventure where he just says yes to everything. And next thing you know, there's, there's a whole world that's opened up to him again. So you start to say yes, or you start to do things. And I think that anytime you're learning something new, you, you really do have to say yes. I don't care really, I think how old you are, I think when you're learning something new, you better start to say yes, because then you start to learn, you see the opportunities. And then as you get more refined with your education, your experience, yeah, I think that it's, it makes sense to say no to things. You know, like too many times I think that people, uh, they start to, to chase rabbits out there, the, the, you know, the shiny objects, if you will. They start to chase these things. And next thing you know, they're, they're, they're ending up with nothing because they're not getting laser focused in. That's the, that's the no, right? Like you start off with this broad, you know, you, you know, no, no blinders on kind of experience and you bring it back down and then you get start, start to get laser focused on what you do. You know, it's, it's easy to start to look at like, you know, for, for us with land, there's certain parts of land that we know are just not right for us, you know, like commercial land. I don't do anything with commercial land. So if I start trying to go chase every commercial property that I have out there, I'm just going to be wasting a lot of time if I just get more narrowed and start to say no and start to get more dialed in to who I am and what I'm doing. I think that that's where like, really where you start to come after some time. I agree with you. I think you're early on. It's yes to everything really training seminars. Pete, you know, you've got to say I, I, my journey has been one of the yes man just struck home with me because I was trying to say yes to so many things. And then for sure I've realized in my late forties or so like, okay, it's time to start pruning. I may have built too wide of a world, but uh, it sure has been fun. But now I'm like, no, no, I got to just keep cutting and trimming. And then the other piece of that, of course, is you can hire great people or have great partnerships, which I'm lucky to have a great partner with me in the real estate practice that is the CEO and runs it. I have a great partner and a lot of great uh, team members in my private equity firm. And so if you've got this wide world and you're like, okay, I want to say no, your no could either be, I'm not going to do it, or it could be, I'm going to have someone else do it. And I'm going to, my yes is going to be learning how to lead leaders. And then by learning how to lead leaders, you kind of have, a, you can have a wide world with a very narrow aperture on your part. Let's, I guess would be the more Warren Buffett way, right? So he buys all these companies, hundreds of them, if not thousands, I don't know exactly. And then they're run by the guys that he bought. So they're still the same CEOs in place. And his, his aperture, his skill set is knowing the numbers, reading the businesses financially, and then having great people that run them for him. So that creates the opportunity for a wide world with plenty of no in it. Yeah, no, it, it's so true. It does bring up a, I'm sorry, Mark, it does bring up a valid point though, is that sometimes when you're looking to grow, you know, like you can get so focused in on, on saying no that you start to get laser focused. And then all of a sudden you're not looking for new opportunities, right? And I think that when you're looking for new opportunities, you have to look for opportunities that parallel what you're doing, right? Like too many times people, they'll, they'll claim, well, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Well, that's fantastic. Okay. But what, what are they doing with that? They're not, they're not continuing to build one company. They, they go and they, they've heard some bad advice from somebody that says, oh, well, you need seven streams of revenue. So what do they do? They go get an ice, uh, an ice vending machine. They go get, you know, a real estate business. They try to create a software company that has nothing to do with any of the other things. And they start to like go all over the place. They get business ADD as opposed to, okay, I'm going to lay some, some tracks down that are, that are parallel to each other so that these businesses, they begin to help each other, right? Like they begin to, to, to get synergies. And then all of a sudden, now you've built a business empire with more revenue as opposed to all of these, you know, fragmented businesses out there that have no rhyme or reason to each other. 
Yeah, I agree with you. It goes back to the 10,000 hours. You can't spend 10,000 hours on seven different things. You got to spend it on one thing. Now it could be real estate, which could mean multifamily, industrial, lots of parallel tracks or single family rentals, which is my specialty. Um, but for sure, there are people, you know, you see the success, you see people getting distracted by too many opportunities. And usually if you have seven, you have none because one will screw up and it'll suck you into it and then you'll lose everything. So uh, the 10,000 hours comes first and then some variety later. Um, but also saying yes means getting to see different pieces of the world. I certainly think in your 20s, you should try a whole bunch of stuff to see what fits for you. Um, and then in your 30s, you should narrow your focus. And then in your 40s, you should maximize your opportunity. So if you think of 30, 20s is experimental. When a guy's quitting their job all the time or hitchhiking around the world, I think that's awesome. 30s, you're like, okay, I like real estate. Let me go all in for real estate for 10 years. And then by the time you hit your 40s, you should be maximizing the opportunities inside that field that you've chosen. No, I, I, I really couldn't agree more. And um, this is the exact advice I will be giving my children. And if they ask, where did you get this? I'll just say, Uncle David. So I would no love worries that role. there. Uh, being a mentor um, to kids is an awesome responsibility and an opportunity. Your father is a colonel. He's a Green Beret. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So what would you say was the best lesson that your father or your mother ever taught you? My mom had work ethic and integrity in spades. Um, she was all about relationships. And she always used to tell me she thought relationships were the meaning of life, which I thought creativity was. But as I've gotten older, I realized she was right once again. Relationships really are the meaning of life. Um, and then my dad taught me that if you're ever in an ambush, charge towards the people shooting you and make as much noise as possible because it's much easier to shoot them as they turn and run from you than it is letting them shoot you while you're running away from them. Pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. So I know you're a big reader. What would you say is some of your most gifted or recommended books at this time? Yeah, I mean, I've read, I just read a great book with a guy that I don't necessarily politically agree with, but I read Trevor Noah's book, Born a Crime, which was an incredible read. I do, I'm doing a lot of autobiographies right now. Um, so I did, uh, I loved Arnold Schwarzenegger's autobiography. It's just great. It's called Total Recall. Um, and one other that I really enjoyed this year was um, uh, Snow, uh, the, the Open, which was Andre Agassi's uh, uh, autobiography. So all three of those I think are great. My all time favorite is probably as a man thinketh, you know, it's an old book, just the importance of managing how you think, you know, uh, nowadays they have a lot of books on the same subject, conscious leadership, 15 commitments of conscious leadership. But the idea is just never be a victim. Anything that's going on in your life, you, you can only affect how you think about it. So if you're going to have a pity party, keep it short. If you're going to, you know, be a victim, do it short, you know, because none of that will affect your ability to get out of stuff. Sure, bad things happen, but the only thing you control is how you react to those bad things. Um, yeah, I read 40 books a year, um, probably 10 of them fiction. And um, I just, I love to read and I've got some great ones. Uh, Conscious Loving is one I'm reading with my wife right now for relationship. It's, it's superb. I read another autobiography on Zeckendorf, which is a guy that built a bunch of real estate in the, it's kind of harder to find. It's, the, it's just called Zeckendorf, I think. Um, he was like, he played Monopoly back in the day, built a bunch of massive things in New York, the United Nations being one. Um, I, I mean, I could give you a million. Necessary Endings was a great book. Why We Sleep was a great book. Um, I'm just very lucky to have a lot of good books. Oh yeah, I, I, I love Why We Sleep. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, I'm getting an OCD about my sleep now because of uh, that book. Me too, a little it's, bit. I got, I've got the Aura Ring. Do you have the Aura Ring? Tracks I don't have sleep. the Aura Ring, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of getting the Uller, which is, that? you know, it's, it's, it's like a water bed that keeps you cool. So oh, wow. you're, you're, you keep your temperature around, you know, 60, between 60 and 68. Wow. Um, it's, it is not, you know, it's like 1500 bucks for a king bed. So yeah, you better be really serious about your sleep. Yeah. My aura ring tracks my REM, my deep and my light sleep and the amount of time I'm going to wake. And then it gives me a sleep score, which, you know, I'm obsessed with trying to get my sleep score up. So, um, yeah, sleep's very important. I love, so Scott Todd, as he was mentioning those books, I know you're a little OCD. Which one of those books resonated the most with you? I'm not OCD, by the way. But um, the the why we why we sleep that's um, that's interesting because you know like I've I've never really been I'm not a um, I don't 
typically follow a set routine in terms of uh, going to sleep. I go to sleep at this time. I wake up at this time. Not saying it's right, not saying it's wrong, whatever. But, you know, I typically go to bed when I'm tired. And I typically wake up naturally on my own uh, pretty, pretty much at about the same time every single day. But I, I basically just keep going until I'm, I'm tired and then I just go to bed. But essentially, and that could be early, it could be late, right? Sometimes it's late, sometimes it's early. But, you know, I don't really have that structure around the, the sleep component of it, but why we sleep. Yeah, I mean, it says, it really what it says, which is astonishing, is that we, some people feel we should push the limits of sleep, just work through it, work through it. But his, the studies show that you have higher heart disease, higher cancer rates, higher sickness, higher illness. Um, I don't set an alarm either. I wake up on my own every day, unfortunately, usually earlier than I would like to wake up. So I have to go to bed at a certain time because I'm going to wake up at five to five thirty almost every morning, no matter what. Um, but I didn't take sleep as seriously until I read that book. I take it more seriously. Now I try to get to bed earlier, keep the room cooler than I used to, um, have, have low electronic stimulation in the room, not look at a, you know, iPad before bed, all that kind of stuff. I'm still terrible at picking up my phone first thing in the morning. I haven't figured that one out yet, but he recommends no screen time late. That's more important and really try to keep no, low screen time early as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know what's interesting about the Agassi book uh, is his father. Yeah. And his father was a boxer. And the philosophy was that if my son hits 10,000 balls a day, he'll be great. Yeah. And so, but it made Agassi extremely unhappy. Yeah. What is your, as a father and as somebody that's a leader of others, from a motivational standpoint, what do you think is the proper amount of pushing to get someone to be their best? Wow, that's a million dollar question right there. I mean, that's a billion dollar question if you can figure that out. I've, I've tended to be way softer than my father was um, because there's a downside to the level of aggression which I was raised with. It's helpful in some ways, but it's not helpful in others. Um, I don't know what the right amount is, man. I'm th honestly, I think I tend probably to be too soft. My kid is my oldest daughter. My daughter, my oldest daughter's 32. She's already out of the house. So she's baked and I made a bunch of mistakes, I'm sure. But, um, I think no matter how good you do it with your kids, you're going to screw them up. That's just their destiny that they have to have some, even if you did it perfectly, they'd be like, my parents were so perfect. I need therapy because I had the perfect upbringing. Right. So, um, we try to push, um, a little bit, but, and what we do is if they commit to something, they have to finish it, but there's no, we try to not yell. We try not to lose our temper. There's no hitting in our household. Um, I don't know, man, that's the million dollar question. Sometimes I think I should just randomly yell at my kids so that she'll be more motivated later, a little bit more screwed up, but maybe a little bit more motivated. I don't know. No, I, I think, I think it was a great answer actually, because I think no matter what you do, it, it, you, they're going to be screwed up either way. So Agassi started doing drugs as a way to cope with it, but yet he became a champion. Yes. So, you know, a long term, which is better. So Scott Todd, it, it, the, really the question is between happiness and joy and the tension there, because we can't sort of make somebody happy. But when you're climbing sort of the second mountain and doing something that's a purposeful sort of goal, there's a lot of joy in it, even though it's hard. And I think what David said then is we're, happiness is not going, there's not going to be, you can't make your kids happy. No, no amount of pushing or being easy is going to make them happy, but you can comp sort of talk to them about what's going to make them joyful, which would be this purpose. And for, you know, let's say Agassi was just being a champion and committing to that because he could have quit at any time, yet he didn't. So I think David's answer saying, I don't know, is sort of the perfect answer. But Scott, I was just be curious what your thoughts are on that. You know, I, I agree. You can't, you can't make people happy, right? Like people have to make themselves happy. And, you know, I think that as a, as a parent or even as a, a mentor or something, it's really, really the best job to kind of guide somebody into pull out the skills that they have because, we all are better at different things. You know, there's people that are great at business and there's people that aren't great at business. They, they're great teachers or there's great, you know, they're great at other things. I think that really what you have to do is you have to figure out how to, to, to get people to tap into the things that they're good at 
and do less of the stuff that they're not good at because the reality is we're not good at everything. I mean, Mark, how many times do we have to talk to people about like, why are you doing that? You're not good at it. And ultimately that's what brings people joy is doing the things that, that you are meant to do because it's, it's inside of you. You know, like when you try to do things that you're not natural at, it's going to be miserable. Yeah, absolutely. So David, before we get to the tip of the week, you've been, you've given us a lot of great advice. I'd be curious, let's just turn it on its head. What's some of the worst advice you see or hear? Um, you know, I think, uh, I think the idea that you have to work a hundred hours a week, you know, to get to where you want, I do believe you got to work really, really hard, but if you don't work smart, it doesn't really matter. And I know that's a buzzword. doesn't really mean anything, but you know, Thoreau said, ants work hard and they're still ants. So this idea that, you know, and I know a lot of people get caught in transactional living, especially in real estate, you know, they just do one deal after one deal after one deal and they make all this money, but they never really have anything to show to it. I think working hard is great, but you need to have assets. You know, all wealthy people have assets. And if you're not acquiring assets, you're just a deal junkie. Um, I think it's not enough to work hard. You need to be working hard and you need to spend some of that time figuring out your plan for financial freedom and executing on that plan. All right. Well, that's a, a fantastic answer. And, uh, Scott, I feel like David's our doppelganger. We, we, we got to get in with his group. We're, we're, we're so aligned in, on, on all these things. So David, we're at that point in the podcast. We want to know your tip of the week. The mentorship has been invaluable this podcast, but just one more tip, like a website, a resource, a book, another book, something actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? Yeah. I mean, for me, the action is setting goals. So in my opinion, you have to have a flight plan for your life. You have to have a goal for your life. And um, my favorite goal book right now is Atomic. Um, you guys know it, right? It's Atomic, Atomic Habits. James Atomic Clear. Habits. Yeah. I mean, I would say that. I mean, we have a goal template at the goaltemplate.com people can get for free, but the reality is you have to choose something. And if you choose nothing, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit because you chose nothing. You have to choose and get after it hard and then make detours and adjustments along the way. So my advice for everyone right now, it's the end of the year, is to go sit somewhere in a coffee shop, get a beautiful journal that you're inspired by, be in a place that you like, that it turns you on and write, what do I want to manifest in 2020? What do I want to manifest in the next five years, but mainly 2020 and write them down. Like, do I want to lose 10 pounds? Do I want to make $100,000? Do I want to add one investment property? Do I want to take my family on an epic vacation? Just write all that stuff down. Stream of consciousness. Don't try to limit it too much. And then put it together in a series of goals. Um, and then be held accountable to whatever you've created. Phenomenal. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? All right, Mark, uh, check this out. I, I like visual things. I like things that are like in columns. I like, you know, like working off of list, et cetera. And so I like to keep my thoughts and projects that I'm working on organized in a way that's kind of visual, visually. And so check out columns.me, columns.me. And what's cool about this, what I think is cool about it is that you can literally create kind of checklist and build them out by week. You can, you can uh, you know, put it by different types of projects, by people. You can change this whole thing around and start to think about, you know, the, the world that you, you live and work in, kind of this, this column checklist, move things around. Like, he, he, I, I love it. I love this thing. This looks really cool. I love checklists. Even, even just our due diligence checklist. I, I don't know how I would get anything done without a checklist. Is this free? Uh, I believe it is, yeah. It's looking like it's free. Holy cow. Yeah. Columns.me. David Osborne, what do you think? Yeah, I'm checking it out myself right now, and uh, um, it looks pretty cool. Uh, anything that keeps you organized and moving forward is a tool you need, but uh, don't make it overly complicated. Just focus on the top priorities and crush those, and your life will turn out good. There you go. Absolutely. You know, Scott, no offense, as great as this tip is, nothing's going to beat my tip because it's davidosborne.com. And just as we discussed in the beginning of the podcast, I forgot that. I think, I think it's, is it Jim Rohn? You are the average of the five people you hang out with the most. Mm -hmm. Start hanging out with the people that have those same alignments. 
And you can just hear from David, he's balanced. It's not just about go out and make a hundred million dollars and forget about all your relationships and just grind it out and grind it out. And next thing you know, you're, you know, a, a wealthy, miserable person. It's balanced. It's, it's intentional and it is going to move the needle in your life, but you have to start somewhere. And I really think that if you start at davidosborne.com, that's a great place to really start making uh, a, a really a significant difference in your life, just surrounding yourself with those people that aren't, you know, spending their lives sort of uh, floating around. Uh, it's intentional uh, in every aspect of their life, whether it's money, spiritual, or uh, health. So check out davidosborne.com. Just a little reminder, the only way, the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a David Osborne is if you do three little things, you got to subscribe, you got to rate, you got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 passive income launch kit, as well as the new wholetailing course, how to double your money 30 days or less. Today's podcast is sponsored by flight school. Talk about accountability, Scott Todd. Why not have Scott Todd, your, your land geek Sherpa, take you up the mountain of land investing, start building up your passive income. Don't have to deal with renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents. It's automated. It's geeky. Learn more. Go to thelandgeek.com forward slash training. David Osborne, are we good? We're great, man. Don't forget, you can get a free copy of Tribe of Millionaires at tribeofmillionaires.com. Fantastic. Another tip. This guy is just a giver, Scott Todd. A giver. He is. Just he is. You guys are He really is. Scott Todd, are we good? We're good, Mark. All right. We ready to do this? Yep. (laughs) Don't, Don't be so excited, Scott. I just can't wait to see David's like as he hangs up in, in, in terror. I know. Uh-oh. All right. One, two, three, let, let freedom ring. ring. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Not, not so bad. <laughs> All right. Thanks everybody. All right. Bye guys. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Start your journey at www.thelandgeek.com and www.scotttodd.net. Rate and review the podcast and email support at thelandgeek.com. Your screenshot for a free passive income launch kit.